If you could uh, come on in and take your seats, please. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Silliman, and it is indeed a great personal pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker today, a distinguished alumnus of Duke Law School class of 1988. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, professor Mike Scharf is a professor of law and director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. He received his undergraduate degree right here at Duke, and then, as I said before, he went on to graduate with honors from Duke Law School, class of 1988. Uh, thereafter, he clerked for Judge Toflat, 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And after that, started uh, quite a uh, lengthy progression of very prestigious assignments. During the first Bush, uh, uh, Bush and Clinton administrations, uh, Professor Scharf was in the Office of Legal uh, Advisor in the Department of State. Uh, he served a number of positions, including Attorney Advisor for Law Enforcement Intelligence, Attorney Advisor for United Nations Affairs, and Delegate to the United Nations Human Rights Commission. Uh, in, 19, er, in 2004 and 2005, he served as a member of, and I think we can only describe this as an elite team, uh, that provided special training for the judges and prosecutors for the Iraqi special tribunal, and in 2006, he led the first training session for the prosecutors and judges of the newly established United Nations Cambodia Genocide, tri Genocide Tribunal. Matter of fact, on your sabbatical, you're the assistant uh, uh, to that, right, if I'm correct? So you're staying very active. Uh, of special note, in 2005, February 2005, Professor Scharf and the public International Law and Policy Group, an organization which he co-founded, non-governmental organization, were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and uh, that's about as distinguished as you can get. Uh, that was for his work uh, with regard to the prosecution of major war criminals, Slobodan Milosevic, Charles Taylor, and of course the subject that he'll be talking about today, Saddam Hussein. And it's from these experiences that I suspect he drew most of the material for the book that he's going to be talking about and will be signing after his comments today. He's a prolific writer. Uh, again, the book we mentioned with our mutual friend Mike Newton at uh, Vanderbilt, who co-authored the book. Uh, he's written over 60 articles that have been published in law reviews and other notable journals. He's written 10 books, uh, one of which, by the way, was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize in 1998, as I believe, Michael. He's testified before Congress. He is a frequent commentator uh, in the print, radio, and television media of all types. Uh, and again, he's on sabbatical this year uh, as a special assistant to the prosecutor of the UN-sanctioned Cambodia War Crimes Tribunal. I first uh, met Professor Scharf when he was up at the New England School of Law. He invited me to come up and speak at one of his conferences, and it's been a great privilege and pleasure to be dealing with him and uh, being at conferences both in Washington and at Case Western Reserve on a number of, number of occasions. But uh, I think you're going to be delighted with his comments today. So again, Michael, it's a light to have you back at Duke Thank Law you. School. Join me in welcoming the Thank you very much, Scott. Well, thank you, Scott, and um, it is just so wonderful to be back here after a few years away. Uh, it's weird, you blink and the whole law school changes. Um, when I was here, it was a little brick building. The last time I was here, it was half of this amazingly beautiful place, and then today I was walking around and admiring your new space and um, also some of the new athletic facilities across the street and everything else that's going on around Duke that makes this such an exciting place to be in law school. Um, and it's so good to see some of my uh, former professors who were the people who launched me on my career. 
and taught me both the substance of international law, but also instilled in me the values about the importance of international law and what we can do with it as a tool for good. And so, in particular, um, Robertson and Everett and uh, um, Professor Robertson, Robbie Robertson, it's so good to see you. And also, um, your visiting distinguished professor, John Dugard, who I haven't seen, uh, or one of the last times I saw him, I think we were climbing up Mount Etna together. So it's a, a strange fraternity of international criminal law experts that meet in different places around the world. Um, my entry into the Saddam trial was very interesting because I had already written an article saying that I thought the war was unlawful. In fact, I had gone to the International Bar Association and had given a speech at their opening plenary where I debated Julian Knowles, who is world famous as being one of the top 10 litigators in the UK, about the legality of the war. And subsequent to that, I had written an article that said that this idea of trying to prosecute Saddam Hussein in Iraq in a trial that the United States uh, Ambassador Bremer was going to create was going to be like prosecuting him before a kangaroo court and no one was going to take it seriously. So that was how I started with this. And all of a sudden in July of 2004, I got a phone call and the voice on the other end of the phone sounded like it was just coming from down the street. It was a very low baritone voice, a little bit like the actor who plays Darth Vader and he says, um, Professor Scharf? I said, yes. He says, this is Greg Kehoe from the Regime Crimes Liaison Office, also known as the RCLO. And having worked in the State Department, I knew that when people call you up and they have initials in the place that they work, that this can only mean one of two things, either big trouble or a lot of excitement. So uh, Greg Kehoe said, I'm calling because we are getting ready to prosecute Saddam Hussein. And we have these judges and prosecutors and defense counsel, and they don't know anything about war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, or even due process under human rights standards. And so we're reaching out to a, an elite team, and this is his words, of experts from around the world. Uh, the team included Jeffrey Robertson, who ended up being um, a judge from the Special Court of Sierra Leone, and Gabriel Kirk McDonald, who was the president of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Um, Michael Newton, for, then at West Point, uh, myself, um, and a couple of other experts from different countries. And he said, we're putting us together. It was sort of like you know, one of these um, teams of superheroes. He made it sound like we're getting them from all parts of the world, and we're assembling them for this important work. And we're going to train these judges. And I said, Greg, do you know my background? Do you know what I've been saying about this trial? Do you know what I've been saying about this war? And he says, yes, 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 we've done our homework. But we also know that you've trained the Yugoslavia tribunal judges and the Rwanda tribunal judges, and you've done lectures for the International Criminal Court, and you've trained other Iraqi judges in human rights law in Dubai, and, and we think that you're the right person for the job. And I said, oh, I don't know, Greg. And I, I said, I, I'm really, I, I think probably not. And he said, look, Professor Scharf, do you want to be on the sidelines, hurling insults at the court? Or do you want to get into the middle of it and make it a better, more effective, and, and um, a court that is fairer than it otherwise would be? He said, this is the court that's going to prosecute Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein's trial is going to go down in history as a historic trial. And it, if you think it's going to be a terrible trial, well, then you come in and make it better. And I really wrestled with my conscience. But Ultimately, I think you know, we're, we're given only so many days on this planet to make a difference, and this might be a place where I could make a difference. What I was worried about is that they would use me to try to say, look, all you critics of the tribunal, we have Scharf on board, so it's, it's not so bad. And so one of the things I said as a caveat is, when I'm done, can I write whatever I want about the tribunal without having to clear it with anybody? Because back when I worked at the State Department, you had to clear everything afterwards, and people would want to edit all sorts of things. And he says, yes, I'll put that in writing. You can say whatever you want. So we said a lot, and it ends up in this book, um, Enemy of the State. This book ends up being the true behind the scenes, inside story of the capture of Saddam Hussein, the attempt to prepare the judges, prosecutors, and defense counsel for the trial, the actual unfolding of the trial, what actually went wrong and what didn't go wrong, and also the fiasco that was the execution 
and it talks about historic lessons from Nuremberg that should have been learned, and also lessons for the future, what, what we can learn from this trial. Um, but ultimately, this trial, whatever you think about it, you know about it, because it was the most watched trial in the world ever, and other than in the United States, the O.J. Simpson trial was the second most watched trial. So probably all of you caught little snippets of the trial. Um, what most of you think you know about the trial, however, is not exactly right. And what, when we were trying to subtitle this, one of the things that we thought about is calling this book, Everything You Thought You Knew About the Trial Was Just a Little Bit Off. And so what I'm going to do today is tell you some of the insights about the trial, some of the things that you would learn when you read the book um, that we learned from the inside, but that the press and the media didn't get quite right. Now, I'm not going to exonerate the trial. And in the end, this trial is going to go down in history as a mixed success at best. But viewed not through American eyes, but through Iraqi eyes, this trial has been much more successful than we give it credit. And that, that's one of the things that I'll be talking about. Um, let me begin, however, with a short reading from the book so that you get a sense of uh, the style of this writing. Now, I've, as Scott said, written 10 books. And some of the books I've written have been these long, ponderous legal books that help you get tenure. One of them had 3,800 footnotes. Um, it had more footnote text. I think it had something like 300 pages of footnote text out of a 600-page book. This is insane how we write as, as legal scholars. But every once in a while, I write a book for the masses. And um, I don't try to write all my books for that. I, I try to balance them. I have different styles. But this one was written for everybody. It was to be accessible to a population um, that reads books over Christmas and want an enjoyable read. If you pick this up and give it as a present, you know your family members will enjoy it. They'll finish it in two or three days. It's not a hard book to read. But let me um, just read a, a segment from it so you get a sense of the style. And also uh, just kind of brings you back into the flavor of what was going on. Um, this is from page 68. It's called The Arraignment. Oh, I'm going to do an imitation of Saddam Hussein. My imitation channels a bit of Alec Baldwin from Saturday Night Live. Uh, anybody who is good friends with, with um, Saddam or Alec, I apologize in advance. Okay. On July 1st, 2004, seven months after he had been captured, 67-year-old Saddam Hussein was brought before an Iraqi high tribunal judge for arraignment. The former leader of Iraq was flown from the detention center by helicopter to a hastily converted building at Camp Victory, a sprawling U.S. military base near the Baghdad airport. Flanked by two Iraqi prison guards and four Iraqi policemen, Saddam was ushered into the small courtroom in handcuffs and with a chain around his waist. Dressed in a dark suit, polished brown shoes, and a crisp white shirt buttoned to the collar, Saddam sported stylishly coiffed hair and a neatly trimmed beard that was a far cry from his scraggly Ted Krasinski Unabomber look at the time of his capture in December 2003. The Arab world had never seen anything like this scene, which was broadcast repeatedly over the next 24 hours. In a region of the world accustomed to tyrants and despots, a seemingly invincible dictator was hauled before the court of his own citizens. The television broadcast of the event showed only the back of the judge's head, and his name was not mentioned for security reasons. But a few months later, the world would learn that the man who read Saddam Hussein his rights and summarized the charges on that July day in Baghdad, was 35-year-old Ra'ad Juhi Hamadi al-Sahadi. Built like a football player, the youthful judge was a graduate of Baghdad Law School. He was originally one of the investigative judges of the Central Criminal Court of Iraq, Iraq's newly established criminal court for ordinary crimes. Judge Ra'ad had come to the attention of American authorities in 2003 while serving in Najaf, when he courageously signed an indictment for notorious Shiite warlord Muqtada al-Sadr, charging him with murder. The public revolution, or the public revelation of the Muqtada al-Sadr indictment placed the young judge and his family in great danger, and they were relocated for their protection to the international zone in Baghdad, where they resided until the end of the Dajjal trial. Because of his solid command of English and his unflappable demeanor, Rod Juhi became an obvious choice to head the investigative phase of the trial of Saddam Hussein. When the authors asked him why he agreed to serve as the investigative judge for such a sensational, challenging, and dangerous case, 
Judge Rod answered simply, this is my job, my responsibility, my duty to my society. He added, many Iraqi people thought that there was no law, no rules, no order, and we wanted to bring the rule of law and justice back to Iraq. In response to the follow-up question of how it felt to be face to face with one of the world's most ruthless dictators, Judge Rod merely shrugged his shoulders and said, I just tried to think of him as an ordinary criminal defendant. The guards removed Saddam's handcuffs and gently guided him to his chair across from Judge Rod, who sat behind a table. The dictator and the judge faced each other about eight feet apart, with a low railing separating them. The first moments were palpably tense. Saddam, who apparently thought he was about to be summarily executed, was visibly anxious. But in a preview of things to come in the later trial during the 26-minute session, Saddam went from being nervous and hesitant to being confrontational and belligerent, while at the same time displaying legal acumen and even a sense of humor. CNN correspondent Christine Anapur, who was there that day, observed that Saddam looked like a shadow of his former self, alternatively downcast and defiant. Answering the judge's request to state his name for the record, Saddam Hussein said, I am Saddam Hussein, the president of Iraq. Former president of Iraq, Judge Rod corrected, to which Saddam insisted, no, present, current, it is the will of the people. As the hearing got underway, Saddam began to challenge Judge Rod, asking who he was and under what authority he was holding the hearing. Judge Rod proceeded to explain that the tribunal that would be trying him had been set up under the U.S.-led occupation. So you are representing the coalition, Saddam asked. No, the young jurist replied, without showing emotion or raising his voice. I am an Iraqi representing the Iraq judicial system. Next, Judge Raj summarized the general charges against the former dictator, which included gas attacks on Kurdish villages, mass murders and the suppression of uprisings, political assassinations, and the invasion of Kuwait. Saddam sat passively as the judge read the charges until Kuwait was mentioned, at which point he exploded. How could Saddam, referring to himself in third person as he often did, how could Saddam be tried over Kuwait? He defended Iraq's honor and revived its historical rights over those dogs. And when Judge Rod told Saddam that Iraqi law would be governing the proceedings, the former dictator remarked, so now you are using the law that Saddam signed against Saddam. When Judge Rod asked him if he could afford a lawyer, Saddam sarcastically replied, the Americans say I have millions hidden in Switzerland. How could I not have money to pay for one? He then added with a smile, I don't want to make you feel uneasy, Judge, but you know that this is all a theater by Bush, the real criminal. As the session drew to a close, Judge Rod handed Saddam a sheet of paper to sign, as required under Iraqi procedural law, indicating that he had been informed of the charges and understood his rights. But Saddam refused to put his name on the, on the document, saying he would not sign anything without his lawyers present. By this time, Saddam's wife and daughters had retained a team of 20 foreign defense lawyers, among the best money could buy. The hearing ended with Saddam asking the judge, have you finished? Yes, Judge Rod answered, kalas, meaning finished, and so much more. Well, there's plenty more excitement in the trial as described in the pages of the book. Um, let me tell you a couple of stories about training the judges and about what happened in the trial that you would not have read in the press. And then I'll open it up to your questions. One of the things we learned in training the judges is that the Iraqis have a completely different judicial system and judicial tradition from the United States, which you would suspect. But that does not mean that they did not have a well-developed sense of justice. In fact, every time we talked to the Iraqi judges, they would say, after all, Hammurabi was an Iraqi. And what they were referring to is the fact that the first code of criminal procedure that was written 3,000 years ago was done by a person from the region, of course, the Hammurabi Code. And so the Iraqis, they always believed that they had a very developed justice system and they were embarrassed about the fact that during Saddam's reign, the Iraqi justice system had not kept pace with the developments throughout the rest of the world. One of the interesting things they told us is that Iraq was one of the first countries to sign the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has its 60th anniversary in about two weeks. Now, when we train the Iraqi judges, 
What we found, however, is working through a translation that things didn't always translate. So, for example, I made the point that due process was so important and the only people that were there to protect the due process and the defendants were the judges, that they had to be like a pit bull about due process. And the Iraqi interpreter, um, a man by the name of Rayad, who, by the way, was killed a couple of weeks after our session and we actually dedicated the book to him, he, he turned to me and he said, Mr. Michael, oh, and, and I should tell you, the reason people call Saddam just Saddam and not Saddam Hussein is not it, to be insulting to him. It's because in Iraq, Saddam is his given name. Hussein was his father's first name, and Takhridi, his third name, was the place he was born. So people would just refer to him as Saddam. And likewise, the Iraqi judges would just call us Professor Michael, because Michael being the equivalent of Saddam. So he says, Professor Michael, he says, you don't really want me to tell the judges that they have to be like a, a, a pit bull. He goes, what is this pit bull? And I said, you know, it's the dog that bites the neck and doesn't let go. He goes, oh, I, I can't say that, I won't say that. I said, no, say it, say it. He goes, no, he says, Mr. Professor Michael, if I say that, the judges will walk out of the room. And I say, why is that? He goes, because in Iraq, calling someone or even comparing them to a dog is the worst insult you can give. He says, think about all your four letter American words, put them all together and it's not as bad as calling someone a dog. And then it occurred to me that when Saddam Hussein in the arraignment said that the Kuwaitis were dogs, that that was a really, really serious insult. So I said to the interpreter, well, all right, they've gotta be really serious about these due process rights. Do you guys have tree frogs? He says, tree frogs? I said, you know, in the marshes, those frogs that suck on and don't let go. He goes, oh yes, we have those sucking frogs. I said, so tell them they have to be like a tree frog. And so they did and everybody seemed to smile and, and they get it. Um, so this was pretty typical of trying to deal with people of a, a different culture. Even the wrong word could set off um, huge disagreements. We thought during the training session that we had at the end of several weeks, reached a common meeting of the minds. And the Iraqis would shake their head and nod a lot. But ultimately when the trial began, much of what we taught them, they didn't follow. Instead, they went back to doing things the way they were used to doing them. Now, this caused all sorts of problems for the tribunal in the press. For example, in Iraq, they don't deal with pretrial motions at the beginning of the trial. They take the pretrial motions in and the judge says, yes, thank you very much, we'll deal with them later. And during the trial when American former Attorney General Ramsey Clark went all the way to Baghdad to be Saddam's lawyer and his reason for doing so was to make a big speech about how the tribunal was illegitimate and that the entire invasion was unlawful and it should be Bush, not Saddam on trial, the judges said, yes, thank you very much, we'll deal with that later. And the press and, and the defense thought that that meant they would never deal with it. And in fact, in the final judgment, which was 300 pages long, single spaced, there is about 60 pages to deal with those pretrial motions. So they did deal with it later, that was the Iraqi way. Uh, similarly, we told the judges that if they allowed Saddam to represent himself or to speak during the trial, other than when he took the stand at the end of the trial to testify on his own behalf, they were courting a disaster. And the judges said, yes, 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 we understand. In fact, the Iraqi law that set it up made sure that they were very clear that each defendant had to be represented by a lawyer and could only be represented through the counsel. And the idea was that you wouldn't allow Saddam to hijack the trial. But in Iraq, that's not how they do things. They have a civil law system where the defendant gets to ask questions of witnesses after his lawyer is done. And the defendant gets to ask questions of the judges whenever they want. And during the 38-day trial, Saddam used this right 30 times to hijack the trial, to derail the trial, to do anything to make the population who was watching the trial broadcast not focus on the acts of torture that were being described, but rather on Saddam being a martyr or being legitimate. And in this way, what Saddam was able to do during his trial was similar to what Hermann Goering did at his trial before the Nuremberg Tribunal 60 years earlier and what Slobodan Milosevic had done at The Hague. Basically, in the case and going back in history of Hermann Goering, um, Robert Jackson, who was the chief prosecutor, got Hermann Goering on the stand and he wanted to make sure that Hermann Goering only answered questions with yes and no 
answers. And his team had developed a really excellent cross-examination to get the Nazi leader to basically admit that everything about the Nazi ideology was wrong. And Judge Francis Biddle, who by historic fluke had been the Attorney General when Robert Jackson had been the Supreme Court judge in the United States, now had the opposite role. He was the judge of Nuremberg, and Robert Jackson was the prosecutor. And they didn't like each other very much. And for mixed motives, Judge Biddle said, I'm going to let Hermann Goering talk as long as he wants. He doesn't have to answer questions yes or no. And in the four days of his testimony, Hermann Goering ended up re-exposing the German people to all the propaganda that Hitler had done in Mein Kampf and, and otherwise. And there were opinion polls taken by the US State Department of the German people to figure out whether Nuremberg had actually educated the German people about whether the tribunal or whether the Nazis had actually committed atrocities. And they asked two questions in these opinion polls. One, did you believe that the conviction of Hermann Goering was a good conviction? And second, did you think the process was fair? The State Department ended up classifying these opinion polls for 50 years, and they were just released about 10 years ago. And the reason they did that is because the German people overwhelmingly said that they did not believe that Hermann Goering was guilty, and that they did not think that Nuremberg was fair. And this was a great embarrassment to the Allies who thought that they were going to re-educate the German people through a trial. And this is similar to what George Bush and his colleagues thought they were going to do in the case of Saddam Hussein. Now, fast forward to Slobodan Milosevic. Milosevic, who was tried by the Yugoslavia Tribunal, represented himself. And he used self-representation to basically hijack the trial. It was very hard for the judges to control him because every day when he was supposed to ask questions and cross-examination, instead he made speeches. And this was the thing that we tried to avoid with the Saddam trial. And the judges nodded their heads and said, yes, of course, of course, we understand. And then they went ahead and allowed Saddam on 30 different occasions to make all sorts of crazy speeches. The worst of these probably was the one where Saddam Hussein, in one of the closing days of the trial, got up and he said, I hear the guns and the explosions outside the court. I know my people are fighting the valiant cause. And I urge them to go and kill as many Americans today as they can and to kill all the Iraqi collaborators too. Go out and kill, 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 kill. And the judge interrupted him and said, Saddam, shame on you. It's one thing for you to say to kill the Americans. I understand that. But to say kill Iraqis. And, and that was a moment of the trial. Now, that was reported in the American media as, look how goofy the, the judges were. But in fact, this was probably a brilliant moment for the judges because it did two things. One is it proved to the Iraqis and to those who were still paying attention to the trial at this point that the tribunal was not a puppet tribunal because no puppet tribunal would have said that about its puppet master. But the second thing it did is it reminded the Iraqi people that Saddam was no longer the martyr, the, the dictator who had their interests in mind. Instead, he was the guy who was out there trying to kill innocent people in markets and in squares and in schools and wherever else the violence was attacking. So this was a pretty important moment. Another uh, quick story about the trial, and then I'll open it up to Q&A. Um, Saddam's attorneys end up boycotting the last third of the trial. And they do this for some reasons that are good and some reasons that aren't good. The good reason they did it was because three of the 25 members of the defense team were actually killed during the trial. And they basically said, how can we go and participate in a trial where we're dropping dead left and right? Um, what The story is much more subtle than that. What happened was the Iraqi tribunal was very worried that prosecutors, defense counsel, and judges might get killed because Iraq was, after all, a combat zone. And people were being killed left and right anyway. And people involved in this trial would be targeted from various elements as well. So they said, look, what we want to do is keep everybody's name secret. We don't want to show your face on television. We want to give you 24-hour around-the-clock protection. We want to house you in the security zone where we can take care of you or house you outside of Iraq. And the defense counsel said, we don't want any of that. We want to be able to talk to the media, which is their right. We want to be able to give interviews on TV. Um, we want to be seen in the courtroom. We don't trust the security guards. And we don't want to be in the green zone because we have law practices. So we'll just take our own chances. And so it was pretty predictable that terrible things would happen to them. 
Um, but it was quite a tragedy, and that should have been thought about, and there should have been other solutions put in place earlier on. Now later, in these other trials that have been subsequent to the first Saddam trial, what they've done is that they've had the defense counsel be able to pick their own security guards, sort of like rock stars do, and then the court pays for them, and they've moved them out of the country, um, and the families out of the country, and they've done other things, so they haven't had any of these killings. But this was a real problem during the Saddam trial. Um, anyway, when the defense team boycotted, what the Iraqi judges did, and we had them prepared for this, is they appointed public defenders who had been sitting throughout the whole trial ready to step in. And these public defenders were being assisted by a really fantastic defense counsel named Bill Wiley, who had worked at the Yugoslavia Tribunal and the Rwanda Tribunal. And he basically ghost wrote the questions that they would ask, and he would whisper in their ear, and he basically made sure that they were doing the right thing. So at the end of the trial, when Saddam was um, given a chance to do a closing argument, his defense counsel stands up and says, I am the public defender who has been appointed to represent Saddam Hussein and give a closing argument. And Saddam Hussein looked at this man and he says, my real lawyers are boycotting and I don't want you to legitimize this process by giving a closing argument. I order you to sit down and shut up. And the defense counsel was very small and scared and he was shaking and visibly freaking out. And you don't see this on the media, but those, who, including my co-author who were there that day, describe it and we have it in the book. He, he was like scared to death. And Saddam says, further, if you give that closing argument, I will consider you the enemy of the state. And what he meant on TV when he said this was, this is somebody who everybody should try to kill when he steps out of the courtroom. And so the title of our book, which most people think is describing Saddam, actually was inspired because this is the label that Saddam gave his defense counsel. Now his defense counsel ends up, after being given this threat, giving a four and a half hour closing argument. It was an excellent closing argument. In fact, one of Saddam's co-defendants was acquitted outright. Three of them were given relatively light sentences. Unfortunately, the argument wasn't enough to counteract all of the documents that showed that Saddam Hussein was actually guilty, so Saddam doesn't get off the hook. But the United Kingdom nominates this little defense counsel from Iraq for the Rule of Law Award in the United Kingdom after the trial. I mean, he's one of the unsung heroes of the story. And so we decided to title our book Enemy of the State because that's what Saddam claimed this other guy was when in fact Saddam ends up being branded the enemy of the state. Um, one last inside story that you'll find entertaining before I tell you, uh, answer your questions. Um, everybody saw the execution and it was an utter disaster because what we saw on TV was Saddam being very solemn, very noble, and you saw a bunch of animalistic guards dancing around, taunting him, saying, Mctada, 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 who was the name of his sworn enemy, who was out there leading the insurgency and the sectarian violence against the Sunnis. And um, then you saw Saddam die, and you saw these people dancing around his corpse seconds later. And he just looked at that and said, what kind of trial was that? In, in the two minutes of the video, everything that we and the judges and the defense counsel tried to accomplish in this, tr this trial was undermined completely, maybe forever. Now, this is an interesting thing about the media. They didn't show the whole video. And we got a copy of it and we got it transcribed and we talk about it in the book. And what happens in the video is this. Saddam Hussein arrives and they said, Saddam, do you want a hood or not? And he says, no, no hood. And so then they start to walk him toward the gallows, and Saddam starts one of his rants. He starts saying, down with the Americans, down with you traitors, you will burn in hell. He looks at each guard in the room, he says, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. And he's calling them dogs and all these other names that are very offensive. And then, and only then, the guards start screaming back at him, no, Maktada, Maktada, Maktada. And then Saddam shuts up because he's accomplished what he wanted to. And what you saw in the video was the second half, but it's out of context. Now, I don't know if that changes anything, because ultimately, at an execution, it's a solemn occasion, and nothing really justifies what we saw. But one other thing I should mention, the guards who are screaming and yelling are not the only voice heard. 
They're the only ones that the media decided to translate. What you can also hear in the background, and what we had translated, is that the deputy prosecutor who had assisted in the prosecution of the Saddam trial, and he's the only official from the Iraqi High Tribunal that's there that day, is heard screaming back at the guard saying, hey, this is a solemn occasion. Stop screaming and yelling. You're ruining this for history. Will you be quiet already? And of course, the media leaves that out. Now, the media, like the human rights organizations, they had their own story that they wanted told. And it was the story that I thought was the true story when I entered, and that is this. They didn't like the fact that there was an illegal invasion, in their opinion. They didn't like the fact that there was a death penalty. They didn't like the fact that this trial was being tried by Iraqis and not by an international tribunal. And so the court was snake bitten from the beginning. And that media lens, that human rights organization lens, is the way that the trial was reported. Mike and I, my co-author, we don't Give, we don't hold our punches. We're very critical of many of the things that happen in the trial. But we tell the full story, like those little snippets that I've just told you today. And when you hear the whole story, I don't know if it changes your opinion at the end, but it gives you a more sophisticated understanding of the challenges of trying to prosecute a former leader in his own country after a transition. And this is not the only time there's going to be such a trial. Um, the International Criminal Court can't prosecute everybody. And so there's always going to be trials of people like Pinochet and other former leaders in their own courts. And the best way to make sure that their courts are fair is for the international community to assist, like we tried to do in the Iraqi context. And we failed in large part, but we learned a lot of lessons. And so at the end of the day, what this really is is a guidebook for doing it right the next time. And as Scott said, I am now leaving from here in a couple of weeks to go to Cambodia to spend the month of November as special assistant to the prosecutor of the genocide trials. The Cambodia tribunal was set up by the UN, but it's a mixed tribunal. And it's a civil law system like the Iraqi system. And so I think there are more parallels and more challenges in store for this tribunal and it's going to be more similar than the Saddam trial than any of the international trials. And so hopefully this book and the lessons we learned in Iraq will help move the ball of international justice to the next level. And with that, I open it up to uh, your questions for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you. Yes. At the beginning of your talk, I think you suggested that perhaps the reception in Iraq of the process and the outcome of the trial may have been better than the reception on the international stage. I wonder if yeah. you could say a little bit more about that. Well, here's one example. Internationally, everybody was very afraid that if they executed Saddam, it would make him a martyr. And in fact, what happened was they executed Saddam and he went away. And on the one year anniversary of his execution, they ended up burying him um, in, in an open place where people can go and pay their respects, which was very debatable. They, there were questions about, well, maybe we shouldn't because that could become a shrine. But they said, no, in Iraqi traditions, we have to give him that. So you go up to, to Crete and his hometown and you can go and visit his grave. Hardly anybody showed up on the one year anniversary. And it wasn't because they were kept away, people just don't care anymore about Saddam. And the lesson was that Saddam's execution, as controversial as it was, it did accomplish the one thing that the Iraqis thought it would, and that is it removed him from the scene. And it gave breathing room, breathing space, for the new government and for the surge to do its part. And part of what has settled things down in the sectarian violence has been that Saddam isn't around anymore. Um, it's removed this very divisive influence from Iraq. I think that historically, if Saddam, or if um, Iraq ends up surviving this period of instability and emerges as a viable, unified, democratic country, people will look back at the Saddam trial as one of the ingredients of that success. And it probably was every bit as important as the surge was to the success. I, it's too early to tell. So yes, to answer your question, there was quite a bit of difference. Also, another interesting twist. During the trial, we tried to convince the judges to be really passive and quiet and well-behaved. And um, we picked the first judge, judge um, the, the, the very first judge that was there, Judge Rizgar, 
Amin was picked because he had a judicial temperament that was very un-Iraqi. He was kind of mellow and evuncular. And what happened was Saddam would yell at him and he was like a duck and he just let it flow off his back and he'd just smile and didn't let it bother him. And the human rights community thought that was pretty cool. The Iraqis hated that. They're like, why is the judge letting Saddam win the battle of the wills? And so there was so much bad press about this judge that he ends up resigning and they put a new judge in and the new judge yells at Saddam and he yells at the other defense counsel and the Iraqi masses who are watching this on TV say, that's what an Iraqi judge is supposed to do. And, and in fact, what we have to remember is if they're going to be domestic trials in a foreign country, we can't judge them through an American lens, a cultural lens or a legal lens. We have to realize that they have a completely different way of looking at things. Now, it's true that this trial was televised gavel to gavel which is the first time ever in Iraq or anywhere in the Middle East they ever did that. Um, it was very open. It was debated every day in all the press. It was probably like a sports event. Um, it was like the America's Cup or something every single day because the Iraqis were captivated by the trial. But ultimately what they got to see was justice unfold. They got to see a defendant be able to, I thought it was terrible that he was up there you know, making speeches, asking questions of witnesses, asking questions of the judges. But he got a, a right under Iraqi law that he was able to use. And he wasn't muzzled. Um, he was given his chance to speak. And at the end of the day, people heard both sides. What's interesting about this case, though, it's much more like Nuremberg than the Milosevic case. There were such good documentary evidence that the Saddam Hussein regime kept that at the end of the day, he was convicted on the strength of his own documents. And they really could have had this trial in one day. They could have just said, all right, um, one of the famous World War II trials um, that Ben Ferenc, who's a colleague some of us know, was actually the prosecutor at, was a three-day trial that only relied on documents and they never had any witnesses. And this trial could have been the same because the documents were so impressive and authenticated and he just signed them all. And he, basically what he did is he said, anybody who was involved in the attempted assassination of me in Dijal should be killed, but also anybody from the Darwak party, who was an, sort of an anti-Sunni party, they should be killed. And um, they basically rounded up half the town, put him in prison. He signed a death warrant for all of them. They didn't even have a trial for him. And the judge who presided over the non-trial was one of the defendants. And it also sends a signal that in Iraq and anywhere in the world, if you preside over a trial that is being used as a political weapon, not as a legitimate trial, that you too can face justice. Um, and then the last thing Saddam did, and he signed this order too, is he had the, the town completely demolished and removed from the map. If you came in early, you saw some of those pictures that were up on the screen. One of the pictures you saw was a satellite photo that the US had taken of before and after. And before, this was the most lush of all the Iraqi towns. It had orchards, it had um, great, vines, vineyards, it, it was really a beautiful place. Afterwards, it was a parking lot, a, a five mile parking lot. And to this day, there's nothing there. And, and it had Saddam's signature. So at the end of the day, this trial could have just been about the documents. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm not as worried about some of the things that went wrong at the trial, because in the United States, we'd consider that harmless error. Um, if, if the trial, you know, gave him his basic rights, and if there wasn't a miscarriage of justice, and if the evidence was overwhelming and it was presented and he had a chance to challenge it, then at the end of the day, I think, you know, history will have been written by this trial. Yes? Um, having, having seen the, and participated in the Saddam Hussein trial and seen um, this case where Saddam was tried uh, in front of an Iraqi tribunal and also the, the social and cultural differences <laughs> that each country's um, domestic courts have, what do you think the implications are for the International Criminal Court and other international criminal right. tribunals um, that are going to be trying defendants in front of judges from other um, backgrounds? Well, there's a couple ways to approach that question, which is a very important question. One is this. The International Criminal Court is only going to prosecute a couple of the highest level people in a couple of countries. Even in countries like Uganda, where they're going to try to prosecute Kony and other high level people, the ICC has said the Uganda government has to deal with the lower level people. After I come back from Cambodia, I'm flying out to Uganda. I have a USAID grant to help the Uganda government with its war crimes trials there. Um, so ultimately, even with the ICC, countries around the world are going to have to prosecute people for war crimes. But the ICC has said you have to 
and your domestic prosecutions comport with the basic due process standards that we have. And one of the interesting things about the Iraqi High Tribunal is that its statute incorporated all of the ICC and Yugoslavia Tribunal, Rwanda Tribunal's due process rights. Um, and they tried then to mix those with the Iraqi system with varying degrees of success. Uh, one of the things we also did is for the first time ever, we took all of the precedent from the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, and the um, Nuremberg Tribunal, and we had it translated, actually by the CIA, into Arabic, and we gave that to the Iraqi High Tribunal, and that's now publicly available in the Middle East for the first time ever. So one of the unintended consequences of this trial is that this entire body of jurisprudence is now available in Arabic, which is like a third of the world, that now can follow the precedents out of these tribunals. Um, but the important thing about this is that this experience of trying to help a domestic system who is not used to the international rules of due process actually comply with those while doing things their way is going to be one that will be repeated over and over and over again all over the world. And so the lessons here are going to be extremely important. The other part of your question is this. I think that history basically has indicated that people trust justice done in their own country more than they trust it being done somewhere far away against their leaders. They also pay more attention to it. And so um, part of the problem with the Milosevic trial and the Rwanda tribunal has been that the local populations are many thousands of miles away from the trials and they feel a disconnect. Whereas in the Sierra Leone case, other than Charles Taylor, they had the trial in Sierra Leone. In Cambodia, they're having the trials in Cambodia. And the reason for that is because empirically there is now evidence that if you want trials to help reconciliation and peace, it's better, if possible, to have them locally. The question is, if you have an insurgency going on, if you have sectarian violence, should this have been a situation where it just wasn't possible to do? Should they have sat there and said, you know what, we just need to move this trial somewhere else, to The Hague or to Jordan or somewhere, because how can you have a trial in this context? And at the beginning of the trial, things weren't as bad as they were over the time. That was one of the subtexts of this book, is things in the courtroom seem to actually be influencing things outside and being influenced by the things outside. And during the nine-month trial, things went from being relatively settled to being extraordinarily explosive. And then now, you know, a year later, things have settled down again. But maybe it was a mistake to try to do this in the middle of such a conflagration. Yes? Yeah, what would you say are the elements for judging a uh, high-level uh, former head of state or high-level just uh, crime officers, international crime officers, <clears throat> to be trial either in an international court, in another country, or in their home country? Because we have different situations, for example, the Pinochet case in which there were many uh, allegations to, uh, against them in Chile and also in the UK and also in some other countries, as well as we have the, with the Panamanian, former Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega, mm -hmm which has many options of being tried either back home in Panama or, or in France. And, uh, and we have like a different case with Saddam, that he was instead tried at home. And what are the factors and elements to decide this? I mean, if politics doesn't decide at all. I mean, I would say this is the context. After World War II, when they had the Nuremberg trials, the world said never again. And the idea was, look, we're going to always prosecute these people. And then the Cold War set in, and instead of never again, we had this again and again. You just kept having it repeated. No one was ever prosecuted. And there was an age of impunity. Um, it, it got to the point where, basically, you had a much better chance of being prosecuted if you killed one person than if you killed 100,000 or a million people. And that age of impunity ended in 1993 when genocide returned to Europe and the international community decided to create the Yugoslavia Tribunal, the first modern-day international tribunal. And after that, they created the Rwanda Tribunal, the Cambodia Tribunal, the Sierra Leone Tribunal, the East Timor Tribunal, the, you know, the tribunals proliferated. And at the same time, you had universal jurisdiction proliferating. So not only were leaders being prosecuted by international tribunals, but they were being indicted and sometimes prosecuted in foreign countries. And what you have since 1993 is a real sea change, a new paradigm shift in international relations. Basically, we're now in the age of accountability. And it's gotten to the point where people, if they commit these kinds of atrocities, know that there is a pretty good chance that ultimately they will be prosecuted either at home 
or in another country if they travel, or in an international tribunal. And that, it's too early to tell, but may be having a deterrent effect. Um, we do know some anecdotal evidence. For example, when the ICC has warned countries like um, the Ivory Coast, look, we're going to investigate and open uh, an investigation because we hear there's atrocities there that suddenly the atrocities stop because people are worried about this kind of thing. So my quick answer is it's good that people now face potential accountability in all these different venues. And I think each situation is unique. It's not always the best place to have someone tried in an international tribunal. It's not always best for them to be tried at home. And so and, and at the end of the day, it's best that they get prosecuted somewhere. Sometimes it's not the best solution. It's the second best or third best solution, but it's better than impunity. And, and there's not an easy answer to your question. But the good news is that people now are being prosecuted all over the place, and there's sort of a culture now of prosecution which didn't exist 15 years ago. There are obviously different um, options when it comes to trying someone, whether it's having a truth and reconciliation commission like in South Africa or um, a Rwandan local kind of community court or a hybrid court or a more formal tribunal. Were, was there any thought about what the best type of hearing or yeah. trial would be and what considerations went into deciding what it ultimately was? There's a chapter that was primarily written by my co-author, Michael Newton, about what happened in 2003 before they captured Saddam Hussein, and they were trying to figure out what to do with post-transition justice in Iraq. And they had um, this big, giant conference of all the judges of Iraq. And in one room, they had a panel on prosecutions and war crimes trials. And on the other room, they had a panel on truth commissions. And there were two people in the panel of truth commissions and 300 people in the panel with prosecutions. And the reason was the Iraqi people were not at all interested in a truth commission or reconciliation approach to their country. And there were also opinion polls taken by human rights organizations that showed that the Iraqi people very overwhelmingly wanted prosecution and they wanted it locally. And so part of the reason the venue was chosen to have the Iraqi High Tribunal in Iraq and have it as a prosecution is because that's what the people of Iraq wanted. Now, was it scientifically done? Would it have been better to wait five or 10 years and then try to do this uh, after things had settled down and cooled down? Maybe, but this definitely was approach that was guided by the popular will of the people. And that's another story that hasn't been told um, until this book. Anyway, it is so good to be back at Duke and to see all of you. I hope um, some of you will get the book. I'm happy to sign it. Um, and others, I hope, will be interested in a career in this field because this law school has a very strong program in international criminal law and national security law. And there are lots of graduates of this school who now and in the future can really shape the course of human events on these kinds of issues. So thank you all again. Outside the lecture hall, uh, Mr. Sharp will be there. Uh, we've got the Gothic bookstore that brought over a number of copies of the book for anyone who'd like to purchase one. And I think he would certainly love to be able to autograph one for you. So he'll be outside. Uh,